Welcome back to Trinity Bible Study. Yesterday we were in Romans chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, and we discussed a very set of dynamic verses that Paul uses to explain where he's coming from with the gospel. He says he's not ashamed at all of the gospel. He's not intimidated by people who don't like what he says. And there's a reason for that. It's because he understands what the gospel is. It's the power of God that brings salvation to us. And he's experienced that in his own life, and he certainly wants others around him to have the same experience. And so, therefore, he is proclaiming it boldly. He's proclaiming the gospel without fear. And he talks about how that gospel was brought to the Jews first, and then also to the Greeks or the Gentiles or anyone outside of the Jewish heritage. Now, the Jewish heritage, having that Old Testament connection to God as we know it now, he goes on to say that it has been transmitted from faith to faith. And that means simply that those Old Testament patriarchs who, who we read of in Hebrews chapter 11 specifically brought that faith down to where Jesus Christ was born um, and conceived of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary and how Christ lived that faultless life. And today we as Christians who make up the church look back historically at Jesus Christ and what was accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection to be our salvation, our atonement, and our redemption. And so we're going to pick up in verse 18 and uh, continue on that journey. Well, let me back up just a second. At the end of verse 17, he makes a very dynamic statement, and that statement is this. But the righteous man shall live by faith. And this is a statement that is dynamic to our salvation and to the process by which we are saved. We are saved through faith, which is an extension of our belief in Christ as our Savior. And then we live by faith daily by putting our complete trust in God. That's very difficult for some people because most of the people, especially living in our nation, live by their five senses more than anything. And it's not a sin to understand what's going on around through, around you by your five senses. But we must discern the world through the Spirit of God living in us. And that's where it becomes very difficult for people to put their complete trust in what God has said, in what God has done, in, in what God is doing, and what we know He will do by what He tells us in the Scriptures. Most people in our nation, live by what they can see, what they can hear, what they can taste, what they can smell, and what they can touch. And then if God conveniently fits into those categories, they'll buy into it. And that's the problem. And we especially see that when people try to lead uh, the masses astray, shall we say. And that's not an uncommon thing to happen. And then again, we're just talking about the difference between living by the flesh, your five senses, and living by the Spirit. And when we live by the Spirit, we live by faith. Because faith is that great spiritual act that we can do and extend in our belief system towards God. For who He is, for what He's done. And like Paul said, the power of God is found in our salvation. And so that's important. Let's go on in verse 18 and read that and continue our study together. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now there's an interesting statement right there. It talks about how the wrath of God gets revealed against people who suppress the truth in their own unrighteousness. What does that look like? Well, to understand what that looks like, <clears throat> we must first of all understand what he's talking about. He's talking about unrighteousness, which we previously unpacked in the avenue of pride, and pride brings unrighteousness, that uplifting of oneself, that one thinking, I know what I'm doing, I know how to do it, I am in control which is a very prideful thing. And we Americans tend to be people who like to control our own lives and maybe other people's lives around us. 
And that brings on an element of pride and exposes the pride within us, which is a very difficult thing for us to admit. Because we don't like to think we're prideful people. Even though sometimes we say, I'm proud of the fact that dot, 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 dot. You know. So it's kind of an interesting paradigm of what we try to dance around in our mentality and then in our theology. And uh, so it's important that we get that right. Pride brings on unrighteousness. And he says that the wrath of God is revealed against these people who in unrighteousness, they have suppressed the truth. What do you do when you suppress something? Well, you take that aspect of it and you bury it. When you suppress something, you're putting it under something, you're keeping it from being active, you're keeping it from being seen, or you're keeping it from having potential, okay? And that's suppressed. Well, how do you suppress what you, this whole thing, um, the truth? Well, Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And in him is found all truth, okay? He, he's the embodiment of God. And if God is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, he represents the core facts, the the absolutisms of truth. And so men try to suppress absolutisms, the absolute truth. Now, if you suppress the absolute truth, what remains is relati relativity. In other words, what's relative to you? What I want to happen to me, what I feel is right, what I think should be done. That's relative truth. Is it the right kind of truth? Well, it's obviously not. Um, there are some things in life that are relative to us as individuals. And I guess in a categorization, you could say there are some relative truths, but they are not the ones that govern our lives spiritually. And if we look at that, then we can see how the truth is suppressed and how relative truth is then displayed. Whatever you want. Whatever you think is right, that's all relative truth. Uh, <clears throat> this is one that is very, very common in America over the last 50 years. You believe what you want, I'll believe what I want. We're all okay. I'm okay, you're okay. And that's the epitome of relative truth trying to be promoted in our culture. And boy, is it ever. And we Christians have a tendency to just walk right in and cowtail up to it because we don't want to offend people. We don't want to look odd. We don't want to look like we're kind of different. We want to fit into the culture and we want to fit into the society. And that's where all of this thing uh, that has come into the church of the church being culturally relevant, uh, which is basically a very, very subtle lie that slipped in uh, from the enemy into almost, I would say, well over half of the churches uh, that claim to be uh, Bible-believing, God-fearing, born-again Christian churches, for whatever that means. And I could be wrong with that figure, but that's what we see an awful lot of. And what do they try to do? They try to fit into the groove of the world with music, with the language in the sermons, with the tenor of the sermons and the message of the talks, as they're often called, and also with just the general attitude of intercongregational fellowship. It's all right to just chill out together and have a good time. You know, don't go too far across the line. You'll be fine. Don't worry. We live in a different world than we lived in 50 years ago. Well, that's the truth. But that's not how we become culturally relevant because we're not called to be culturally relevant. When we do that, we suppress the truth and we start to fit into this category of the prideful people wanting to be like everybody else, wanting to fit in, wanting to do this. I want to feel good. Okay, I want to, I want to have a good experience. And this is where all of this feeds into this whole thing of men who are out there to suppress the truth to begin with. And they just play with these ideas and push them into the church. And this is what happens. And it can be very, very difficult 
to understand and to see because we get so blindsided by it. And it is actually unrighteous men suppressing the truth. And the word here says that the wrath of God is going to be revealed against them. <clears throat> Continuing on in verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Wow. So, what this verse is telling us and what Paul is saying is that everybody has an instinctive knowledge of God. All of his creation have an instinctive knowledge of who God is. And they know about God and, and it has become very evident to them. Now, uh, we always get this question, well, what about the people over in some weird country somewhere that have never heard the gospel, never read a Bible, never had one? This is where it comes into play. <clears throat> we have to understand this very clearly, that God's presence, that knowledge of, a, of something bigger than them is always there. And every one of us knows that there is always something bigger than us. It's because we are the creation and he is the creator. But when you don't want to accept that, when you've made a choice that this feels better, that sounds better, I don't want to hear that because it makes me feel like I've sinned or whatever the discourse would be around that, then you start to take the truth of that knowledge of God that every one of us have instinctively and that's why some people always, you know, rebel and say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Well, you have to understand they're actually acknowledging there is a God to not believe in the God or else they wouldn't have a problem with that. And that's why the instinctive aspect of knowing that there is someone who created us, something that is bigger than us. And that is who we know to be God because he's been revealed to us. Very important. And most people who don't want to hear that deny it completely and push it aside and they in turn take the truth and suppress it because they know better. But they don't want to live in that realm. They've made a choice. They've had a bad experience. It has tainted them and they can't get over it or they refuse to get over it or they don't know how to get over it. And that's where we as Christians have to come in in those scenarios and show them the love of Christ in who we are, in what we do, and in how we present the gospel. And we keep going back to, to Paul when he said he's not intimidated by people. He's not ashamed of the gospel because of what it is. It is the power of God that brings people into salvation, into a right relationship with God through God's only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, it's very interesting. He says that because... Uh, or because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident in them. That is how when God created man, there was an, uh, a desire immediately for a relationship with him because he is the creator. Uh, a little interesting example of this we see in our culture, and uh, we have a lot of people uh, in the world today who... Uh, were orphaned or were deserted as very, very small young children. <clears throat> and they have been picked up by other families and brought in in adoption. And it never ceases to amaze me, especially in the churches that I have been the pastor of, when one of these adopted adults starts seeking out their real bloodline parents, or at least trying to find out whatever happened to them or if they're still alive, and tries to make some connection. Sometimes they're very disappointed when they find out the real facts, and sometimes they actually build a healthy relationship, but it's an instinctive desire to want to know. That's just a little type and a shadow of who we are as humanity, the creation of God. He has made himself evident to us, and we either choose to want that relationship or we choose to reject that relationship. And that is our choice. And when we come to him for salvation, we must put our complete trust in him for if we want that power to live by that God can give us through Jesus Christ our Lord and through his Holy Spirit living in us, then we must give him our complete trust. Even when it doesn't seem rational, even when 
Everybody around us is contrary to it. We must put our trust in him, for it is the power of God that will bring us through. And Paul makes that very clear, and it's very evident to everyone that's walking on the planet today, whether they want to admit it or not. And some people, of course, deny everything, but it is evident in their hearts. Let's pray. Our gracious God, you have made us. You have created us, redeemed us, and sustained us. Help us to learn and understand that even more. Help us to understand that your salvation is what we need, and you have brought that into our very being from the moment we were born. You have been there, and you have made yourself evident to us. Help us to lead others to find that evidence so that they can come to salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. These things we pray in his name and under his authority. Amen.